Mining the Word, staying true to Scripture while applying it to my everyday life. My schoolmate Sosun Mfuni tells a lot of stories that happened in Africa, and one particular story seems connected with the chapter we're looking at today. In Africa, some years ago, there was a young boy named Billy, and he had such a temper. Too many times when there was a disagreement, he would come and try to fight to get his own way. It had to happen his way. And once he even chased someone around with a spear, and they thought, hey, this really isn't a good thing. One day, he was really upset because his father came home to announce, I'm being transferred to another school. Now, Dad was a teacher, and they had been in the school for a few years. And one of the saving graces that Billy had is that even though he could get really hot and bothered, he was good with plants. So when he was having a lot of stress and causing a lot of stress with people, it could be helpful for him to go off into the garden and work with plants. And he had three little banana plants that he had been working with, tenderly cultivating them. And it looked like they were going to yield bananas in maybe three or four months. He was so excited about this, but when Dad said, we're moving to another place down the road a long way, he began to stew inside. It's not fair. How can we go away from our place? And I've worked with these bananas. I planted them. My hands should harvest them. I should eat them. And his father said, I understand. I planted those peach trees over there, and I won't get to eat the peaches either. But Billy said, but you don't understand, these were my banana plants. No other boy should come and eat the bananas that I worked to grow. And Dad said, by the way, when you say I and mine and all this stuff, it sounds a lot like Lucifer in Isaiah 14, and he became the devil. And Billy said, no, I don't care about Lucifer or anything like this. I just want to know that I get to eat the bananas I worked so hard to grow. And then he went out in a stew. He went outside. Oh, my banana plants. How can I let another? And then a thought occurred to him. I know what I'll do so I don't lose those bananas. I won't let anyone eat them. If I can't have them, no one can have them. He had a plan. Everyone was hurrying and scurrying, packing things into boxes, trying to get ready before the removal van, well, they call it a removal lorry. We would call it a moving van, before that would show up. And then one day there was a knock on the door, and his dad answered it, and there was a telegram. Meanwhile, everyone was wondering, what's in the telegram? Dad looked at the telegram, and it said, day after tomorrow, the removal lorry will be here to take all your stuff. Now they really worked hard. But Billy decided this is the time to execute my plan. Quietly, he slipped into the storeroom, dipped a cup into the bag of fertilizer, and he dug a hole exposing the roots of each banana plant, and he put the fertilizer directly on the root. He knew what that would do. Fertilizer helps plants grow, but when you put it straight on the root, it burns the root and kills the plant, and he covered it all up with dirt so no one could see what he had done. Sure enough, The removal lorry came, they took all their stuff, they went far away to another school. And then one day, a year later, Father looked at Billy with a big smile on his face and he said, the teacher who took my place at the other school, he is going to study in America. So I will be going back, we will be going back to our old house. Isn't that exciting? Meanwhile, Billy's heart sank. The old house, the house where the banana trees are, or the banana plants, rather. I hoped that they survived somehow, but I remember the day we left, already the leaves were starting to get brown. It looked like I was succeeding. Well, again, the removal lorry came and took all their stuff back to where they used to be. And as they came into the yard, everyone's so excited to see their friends. Well, Mom and Dad were excited. Billy's twin sister was excited. But Billy was worried. And sure enough, as he walked in the backyard, He was horrified to realize he succeeded in his ugly plan from before. Then he felt a hand on his shoulder, and Dad said, What's wrong? Where are the banana plants? And Billy said, I have something to tell you. While Dad was very disappointed that Billy would do such a thing, Billy was disappointed he'd do such a thing. He could be eating bananas. He could have had the joy of of the bananas that grew the year after, and it would never be. 
he decided he would find some little shoots to start new banana plants again like he had done for the ones he killed. And he realized that day, when I insist on my way, it has to happen for me and I'm the most important, that's when things go sour. And he began a trip in a different direction, a direction where Billy didn't have to be a selfish, mean-spirited person, but he could think about others, like his father who planted peach trees, though he thought he would never eat the peaches himself. Welcome back to Mining the Word. But before we jump into our chapter for today, let's pray. Lord in heaven, please guide us as we dive into Esther chapter 6, that we will learn to be not like Billy, how he was, but Billy, how he became. And we will truly build our lives on Jesus' way. In his name I pray. Amen. Come with me to Esther chapter 6. We left off with Esther 5 last week, and we notice that this is a bit of a turning point, but we'll start first with verse 1. That night the king could not sleep. What night? Back in chapter 5, we just saw Haman and the king had been invited by Queen Esther. They enjoyed this banquet, and the king was eager to find out what is your request? I'll give you even half the kingdom if you ask me. And she said, my request is that you all come back, you and Haman come back to a banquet tomorrow. Well, the king knew it must be so serious if she keeps delaying a little bit more. Well, meanwhile, even though God's name is never mentioned overtly, and back in the end of the message on chapter 2, we saw it's actually hidden four times in Hebrew. That's another story. But we see it's hidden in every language it's translated into in this way. Instead of saying the word, the story is described in a way to show there's a power, God, at work without naming him. Just like we don't see a cloud in the day like Israel did in Exodus 13. We don't see a pillar of fire at night like they did in Exodus 13. In a similar way, these people didn't see that stuff and they had to pray and act. They had to do things that they believed God would want them to do and then try to look for him to nudge one way or another. This is right, this is wrong, just like we do. And so we come to verse 1. That night the king could not sleep, so one was commanded to bring the book of the records of the Chronicles, and they were read before the king. He's tossing and turning. In Hebrew it says that sleep fled from him. And as I see this, it looks like it's something outside the king's control. He has... He thinks he's in control of everything, but even his sleep he doesn't control, and he's asking people to take care of things. He's calling for the records. Meanwhile, Haman, we know from the last time, Haman has built this impaling pole. They call it a gallows in most translations in English. It's actually for impaling the victim, and he's eager. Tomorrow I'm going to ask the king, and I'll put Mordecai up there, and I get to see the end of my enemy. We see down to the finest detail God has lined things up. Verse 2. And it was found written that Mordecai I had told of Bigthana and Tirash, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus, or as the Hebrews called him, King Ahasuerus. Well, Ahasuerus had these two people try to take his life back in chapter 2, where one was called Bigthan, and here he's called Bigthana, the difference between a Hebrew way to say it and an Aramaic way to say his name. But anyway, this reward that should have gone to the one who saved the king's life, we noticed it was really weird. Mordecai arranged saving the king's life in chapter 2, and in chapter 3, the king honored Haman. And at that time, Mordecai may have wondered, why would God let this happen? Why would God allow someone else to get the credit, to get the glory, to get the promotion, and yet I did something? God had a really good reason for doing it that way. If Mordecai had been honored back then, there would be no way to save the people of God here. But notice how God works by the delayed honor. Verse 3, Then the king said, What honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. Right away we see three things that line up. I think they're more than coincidence. One, the honor has been delayed until the exact minute it is needed, the night before this man should be executed. 
that's the night that he's going to be honored. And in fact, point two, there seems to be a search that's ordered because the king isn't just hearing random stuff. Apparently they're searching, finding, where is this thing? Maybe even it's a sympathetic eunuch who's thinking, wait a minute, we are frustrated that the wrong person's getting honor and the one that we can trust is the one who's now in great danger and it looks like Haman's ready to kill him. And then number three, the orchestration of the exact moment of Haman's arrival. But let's look at that in verse 4. So the king said, Who is in the court? Now Haman had just entered the outer court of the king's palace to suggest that the king hang Mordecai on the gallows that he had prepared for him, or actually to have him impaled on the impaling pole that was built very high. So here he is, waiting, taking a risk like Esther. Esther took the risk, approaching the king uninvited, and now Haman's approaching the king uninvited. In fact, he's coming not to the throne room, apparently. He's coming more toward the living quarters. And yet the king and Haman have this chummy relationship. Now, it seems strange. The king, who has been very friendly with Haman and very happy to let Haman arrange killing all the Jews, including Mordecai, all of a sudden is interested in honoring Mordecai. But that's part of the weird plot that falls into place by God's design. Verse 5, the king's servant said to him, Haman is there standing in the court. And the king said, let him come in. So Haman came in and the king asked him, what shall be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? Now, if you'd been in Haman's shoes, what would you think at that point? Remember, in his mind, everything is about Haman. I am the top dog. I am the most important. Everyone else should be lowly in comparison to me. They all must bow. Even the king commanded that. For some reason, this terrible Mordecai, he's not bowing to me. Now notice, this has gone through a progression. You know, there have been people who try to talk about psychological disturbances and all that, and Sigmund Freud was one, but one of the people trained in psychoanalysis, psychoanalysis began to question, is this really the way to help others? I'm not sure that's quite right. So Albert Ellis, as one of the psychoanalysts, began recognizing this is not helping certain people. In fact, it helps some and a lot of others don't get the benefit I think they could through another method. And he became, through his experimentation and whatnot, he became what you might call the grandfather of cognitive behavioral therapy. But in the process, he launched this thing where he recognized you don't just go back into the past trying to figure out what went wrong many, many years or decades ago. Rather, what you do is you start right where the person is and look at the thinking. Because he looked at three things, A, B, C. A is activating event. What comes? The activating event for Haman was... He looked and he saw Mordecai did not bow back here a couple chapters ago. And so that led him to be the belief or self-talk. Huh, he won't honor me. He's a bad person. He's causing me all this grief. I must get rid of him. And that leads to see the consequence or the reaction, the response, whatever you want to call it. He had the gallows built or actually the impaling pole. Let's get rid of him. We call it crooked thinking when people don't recognize that middle piece, the belief. They think, oh, he made me angry, I have to get rid of him. And often we think that way, oh, this guy cut me off on the highway, he did it just to make me mad, really? That's crooked thinking, where you jump from A to C, from the activating event, the trigger, all the way to the consequence. Well, that's the action or reaction. But to avoid that, we need to look at the middle piece, the B, the belief or self-talk. Well, now we're coming to another one of these crooked thinkings of Haman. Because as the king asks what should be done for the man the king delights to honor, that's the trigger, the A, the activating event. Immediately, what is the B, the belief, the self-talk? This time, the Bible actually tells us. Let's continue in the bottom of verse 6. Now Haman thought in his heart, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? <laughs> yeah, there it is. Everything's about me. Other people don't matter. I'm the most important. And so with that belief or self-talk, now comes the consequence, the outcome. Verse 7, And Haman answered the king, 
For the man whom the king delights to honor, let a royal robe be brought which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on its head. Then let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor, then parade him on horseback through the city square, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. You can almost see the picture in Haman's mind. Let's see, out of all these noble helpers, Mordecai is very significant. This way, Mordecai, my enemy, who refuses to bow, will get a direct command from the king to take me around the town. I will be dressed in the king's own robes. I will be sitting on the king's own horse, and people will see me go by. They will hear Mordecai, of all people, the man I thought I would have hanged. He's going to run around saying, Thus shall be done to the man the king delights to honor. It wasn't going to happen that way. In fact... It would be one of the most horrifying days in the life of this man. Verse 10. Then the king said to Haman, Hurry, take the robe and the horse as you have suggested, and do so for Mordecai the Jew who sits within the king's gate. Leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. The king had to add that very explicit command, Leave nothing undone. Perhaps he had noticed this rivalry. Perhaps he'd noticed there seems to be a bitterness that Haman has toward Mordecai. Perhaps he had this thought, the very man who saved my life is one of those people you think to get rid of, and maybe it brought him a sort of fiendish delight to begin turning things. I don't know. But I do know that this was orchestrated to perfectly line up. The moment... Haman came to ask, may I have permission to kill this guy? Is the moment the king is ready to find out, how can I honor that very person? God lined everything up perfectly. Verse 11, so Haman took the robe and the horse, arrayed Mordecai, and led him on horseback through the city square, and proclaimed before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Can you imagine what that did to Haman? When a person has his whole life revolving around self, a very deep-rooted selfishness, then something like this would be one of the most horrible things you can imagine. But let's take it one step beyond. This wasn't Western culture. This was Eastern culture. In the West, we are more concerned about innocence or guilt. But in the East, they're more concerned about shame or honor. So for an Eastern person now to be required to honor the one that he loathed would be one of the most horrible things you can imagine. In more recent times, like the last 150 years in Asia, at least in Korea where we lived, you'd sometimes see pictures of the people who were condemned to die and their heads would be covered. It was part of the reality. You're facing the shame of being executed. And when a person was accused of wrongdoing, In America, we might say, oh, it all depends on the meaning of is, you know, trying to talk our way out of looking guilty. Whereas in Asia, they try to hide the shame. You'd find them hiding the faces, turning away from the cameras. Yes, of of course, this transfers to some extent in opposite ways to opposite cultures. But especially in Asia, there's that keen sense of honor. And now Haman has had the most humiliating experience ever in his life, I would guess, And he's supposed to go to have a special banquet with the queen and king. And everything's all conflicted inside. So what happens after this? Verse 12. Afterward, Mordecai went back to the king's gate. But Haman hurried to his house, mourning with his head covered. He has the outward symbol. It's like, oh, I can't have anyone see me after this horrible experience. I just can't have anyone seeing my face. When Haman told his wife Zeresh and all his friends everything that had happened to him, his wise men and his wife Zeresh said to him, If Mordecai, before whom you have begun to fall, is of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him. Interesting. I am interested in the verb that is used for talking here. Verse 13 in my Hebrew Bible starts with, And they said to him, 
that's masculine. And it talks about his friends, masculine, and his wife, feminine, his wife, Zeresh, all together. That's the normal way. Remember how it was back in chapter 5? Verse 14 in my Hebrew Bible says, Watomer lo zeresh ishto, etc. Watomer, feminine. And we noted how in Hebrew, if you have 99 women and one man, as long as there's one man in the group, they will use masculine verbs to describe what's happening. But back in chapter 5, when Zeresh is saying, oh, this is what you should do, build a gallows, and all the friends are saying, yes, yes, yes. We see that the author revealed in a shocking grammatical construction in Hebrew, very shocking, the woman took the lead. Ah, this is what you should do. And the guys all said, yeah, yeah, it's fine. But now, when things are falling apart, we see the guys taking the lead, and they're looking and saying, this isn't good. If it's going this way, you are on your way down the drain, basically. And perhaps they were aware of such things as 1 Samuel 15 or Exodus 17 or other places that talked about the total destruction of Amalek because Haman was an Agagite, maybe a descendant of King Agag that had gone against King Saul and Saul was supposed to wipe them all out. Anyway, that's another story from 1 Samuel, 17, uh, 1 Samuel 15. But now he comes to the moment when his own wife and friends are saying, it's over, it's not going to end well, you are beginning to fall before him. Verse 14, while they were still talking with him, the king's eunuchs came and hastened to bring Haman to the banquet which Esther had prepared. Yes, important people would be escorted, just like we see Joseph's brothers escorting Benjamin to him way back in Genesis as finally they're bringing him back after all these 22 years of separation. We see again and again in, in the Bible accounts about the important people being escorted in. And so now he's being escorted. Come, come, hurry, it's time for the banquet. Oh, the confusing, conflicted thoughts that must have been inside his selfish heart. This is the worst day of my life. Yesterday I was bragging. Only I am invited with the king and queen for this banquet. And today I feel like trash totally humiliated. Everything's turned upside down. And my own wife and friends are saying, this isn't going to end well. You are beginning to fall before Mordecai. What can I take from the story? Well, I would take two things. One, a major point, and another, a corollary, which may be more practical for your week to come. Proverbs 16:18 says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. There was Haman with his haughty spirit, so proud, it's all about me. Everyone else must be below me. You can be certain that it will happen. Even though it might not happen right away, you can be certain it will happen. The destruction will come. In fact, that grammatical construction when uh, the friends of Haman and his wife Zeresh say, you know, you're going to begin to fall before him, they use that that same grammar, just like Genesis chapter 3, when God said, if you eat of this, well, he said it in chapter 2, if you eat this fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will certainly die. And Eve quotes that to the serpent in chapter 3 of Genesis. And now that same grammar, different vocabulary, it is certainly happening. You will fall before Mordecai. So that's a primary point. When pride is the thing that functions in my life, when that is what guides my decisions, I will fall. But there's a secondary point. Remember we looked at that A, B, C way of thinking. Instead of just jumping from, oh, you made me do this. No, that's not true. No one made you do anything. The person can trigger the activating event, the trigger, and it doesn't jump directly to a consequence of your bad action. In between is the B, belief or self-talk. Like Haman saying, who could be more needy of honor than I? The king would certainly want to honor me. That was his self-talk. Or earlier, the self-talk about, oh, Mordecai is just doing this to get me upset. And that led to the consequence of him going out and having the impaling pole erected near his own house. When we have the bad thinking, it leads to bad actions. When we have the incorrect thoughts, it leads to incorrect outcomes. But there's hope. We can actually go back and have a letter D, the dispute. Wait a minute. 
is it really true? Is it really true that I am the one, the only one the king would delight to honor? Maybe I should be careful. Might be he has someone else in mind, you know, or back with Mordecai refusing to bow. Is he really doing this just to get me upset? Or might he have a faith that makes him faithful? And I should respect that. When we don't have that dispute, we just run from A to C, from the activating event to the consequence. But that B, the belief, is what gets me there. And I can come back and dispute that false belief. And then I get an E, which is a different experience a different event at the end it turns into a better way i want to challenge you in this secondary way well first the first way let the lord deal with pride in your heart don't let that be a guiding principle in your life and number two think carefully when you are feeling some kind of emotion go back and think what did i tell myself about that thing that happened it may be i need to change what i'm telling myself it can happen in a good way. It reminds me of Jesus. Only Luke tells this story in Luke 23. As they were pounding nails in Jesus' hands and feet, what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What? They knew what they were doing. They were paid to kill people in the most painful, humiliating way possible. They did that very well. But they didn't know. We are pounding nails into the Messiah. We are pounding nails into the one who is dying to save us from sin. We are pounding nails not from our own hearts, but from the instigation of the enemy, the archenemy Satan, getting us to do what we would never do if we fully understood what was going on in life in this day at this time. And in a similar way, we are able, like Jesus, to reframe this. He reframed it as, they don't know what they're doing. They're doing their job, but they don't realize they are causing suffering for one who has come to save them. And I can reframe things. And when I change my belief about what that other person is doing and why he's doing it, it can change my reaction, change my response, change the way I deal with other people. I know there's a whole lot more that could be explored there, but I'll leave it at that for today. Let's pray. Lord God, Thank you so much for caring about us personally. Thank you for engineering things to save the life of Mordecai and eventually his people too. Please guide us as we go through experiences that tempt us to act selfishly, that we allow your spirit to empty us of self and fill us with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you as you continue mining the word. And I challenge you, really think about what are you telling yourself when some kind of trigger comes into your life? A, B, C, the activating event, the trigger, the B, the belief or self-talk, and it leads to a consequence. If you don't like the consequence, like the hot temper or the reactive behavior or whatever consequence, come back and explore what am I telling myself? And you can dispute it and get a different consequence, a better one through the power of God. God bless you.